Thomas. Uh, my name is Martin Klein. I'm with the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and I'll briefly take a few moments to talk about our investigation into Bloom filters for Web Archives holdings. This is collaborative work with uh, my colleague Luda and our collaborators uh, Carolina, Inge, and Drajinko from uh, uh, responsible basically for the Croatian Web Archive. Uh, this work is also um, generously funded by the International Internet Preservation Consortium, so we're very thankful for their support. What is the problem that we're trying to address? Well, generally speaking, uh, uh, archival holdings are basically opaque, right? Do you know what the German uh, National Library and their web archive holds? I don't, uh, and I don't mean to pick on the Germans here, but it's an example of so, uh, um, where the archive is somewhat uh, not particularly transparent, right? And this, uh, as uh, Andy Jackson, who, by the way, is the lead of the web archiving program at the uh, 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 British Library, a very large web archive, has uh, conveyed, even for web archiving experts and folks intimately familiar with their collection, it's not always known, right? And obviously Helga is an exception, but we had just learned that he's out of a job because he made himself uh, uh, obsolete, right? So uh, there are a couple of ways of going around this, right? You can search CDX files if you have the domain knowledge and access, uh, but that's tricky, right? That's uh, difficult. We've also seen from experience that some web archives are very, very hesitant sharing CDX files, basically the index files, with others because of uh, concerns about legal repercussions uh, doing so. So uh, the problem remains, um, archival holdings are largely unknown. One of the solutions, and if you're familiar with our work, you'll know that is uh, what we came up with in the past, the Memento Protocol and derivative services from that, such as what we call the Memento Time Travel Service, a federated search across more than two dozen web archives around the world that basically Google style lets you ask do you ha who has a copy of, for example, the JCDL 2022 website? And the little screenshot on the top right of the slide will tell you five web archives or six have copies, and here are the links to these copies, and so on and so forth. Which is great. It's a standard. It's an RFC. It's uh, broadly adopted. Almost all publicly accessible web archives are, are Memento compliant, so they do provide a level of interoperability there. Um, infrastructure exists, uh, we've done our share in that context, but of course it's not all uh, great, right? There are uh, limitations to that, such as closed web archives, dark web archives don't necessarily play game, uh, play a role in this game, right? Uh, and also there's always, as, as usual with federated services, uh, a performance issue, even though we've done a lot of work on optimizing our services here. So. We were curious, and that's really the bottom uh, line of this, we're curious to investigate Bloom filters to address this problem to an extent. So it's not meant as a memento replacement, right? Far from it. It's a complementary solution, potentially. So we're curious about that. I have an, a link here to, uh, to a web page that lets you visually explore how Bloom filters work. It is basically a data structure that tells you yes or no if you ask it, do you have this entry? Right? Uh, based on hash values of this entry, in our case, uh, URLs. It is very, very fast, as it turns out. It's uh, often used and really uh, good for checking, uh, uh, do, you have a co do you have this URL, for example, right? Uh, the other really intriguing feature of a Bloom filter is that it's, as I mentioned, based on hash values, so you're not sharing anything in plain text, which potentially can address the, uh, the, the legal uh, concerns of some archives to share CDX files, for example, or content in general. Right? Here we're talking about hash values of things. Maybe that's easier uh, to share with others. At, at the moment when we started this experimentation, we had no clue uh, whether it's even feasible to use Bloom, Bloom filters for that, what it costs, and what the performance is, and uh, uh, how it scales. So we're intrigued to look into these sort of dimensions. Right? We found a Bloom filter library that looked really promising, so we used it. I put the link up here on the slide. It offers basically two options to implement Bloom filters. One is in memory, and the other one is in a Redis database. So pick your poison there, right? Uh, and it takes two input uh, parameters uh, to generate your Bloom filter. The first one is the anticipated number of URIs. How many URIs would you like to put into this Bloom filter? And what is your, uh, uh, your target false positive rate? So are you okay if it uh, gives you false information or do you really want it very, very precise, right? And then what the library does is it, uh, it does its magic, and I'll get to this in a second, and it, read, uh, it automatically chooses the number of hash functions to use and the type of hash functions to use. 
So then we started experimenting and uh, from our collaboration partners in Croatia, we got a CDX file um, from their last domain crawl, which was 180 million URLs uh, strong. So we rounded that up to 200 million, which was our first input parameter. And we said, well, let's take a 5% false positive rate. That seems like an acceptable uh, sort of a threshold. And then the library came back with five hash functions are optimal. And uh, uh, our anticipation, our as in the library, anticipation of the false positive rate is actually three quarters of a percent. Well, that seemed pretty promising, but we still didn't know much. Uh, the reason why, one of the reasons why we chose 5% uh, is false positive rate is there's a correlation between the false positive rate and how large your bloom filter actually gets. So that, that seemed like a reasonable choice at the time. Uh, a brief overview of our findings from that first stage of experimentation. Uh, the first red line up here is the time to ingest. That was our first uh, parameter that we were curious about. How long does it take to, to, to generate a bloom filter? Uh, we created code, we shared it with our colleagues in Croatia, and uh, we're, we're in parallel executed the code. And it turns out that ingesting uh, or creating a bloom filter based on the Redis database is roughly a matter of two to three hours, right? Depending, of course, on your computer environment and so on and so forth. But the ballpark was interesting to us because that's feasible. It's not the end of the world, right? If you're generating it in memory, it's much faster, which also was good news to us. The second piece of information that I wanted to highlight here is the notion of how fast does a bloom filter respond to our queries? And the answer is crazy fast, right? A fraction of a millisecond, which was another one check mark basically awesome uh, this can really work and of course it's a little bit faster even though you know one more one more zero who cares <laughs> it's a little bit faster if you implement it in memory than in a database which makes sense intuitively right uh, the last row just as an foi because i'll come back to that later uh, we can serialize a bloom filter into a plain uh, csv text file uh, and it is also not crazy slow so a matter of a few seconds uh, I, I would say that i could wait for that <laughs> All right, uh, I realize those uh, uh, axes are hard to read, but that's not the point. The point here was to investigate how reasonable are the choices that the Bloom Filter library does on our behalf. So here we asked the question, what about those available hash functions? Which ones are good, which ones are bad? And it turns out some are worse and some are really good. And the green line here is the, uh, the response time for a Bloom Filter, and that is basically constant regardless of which hash function you use, but you see the false positive rate goes up for some hash functions because they are bad for some reason or another, right? And we used a whole bunch of URLs to ask those questions, uh, but the, the picture is basically the same. Then we ask, well, on our behalf, the, hash, uh, the, the broom filter library picked five as the optimal number of hash functions. Is that a good choice or a bad choice? No idea. So we varied with this parameter and uh, it turns out, of course, the uh, the response time uh, increases slightly the more hash functions you use. That uh, intuitively makes sense. And uh, on the top right, you'll see if you go much beyond five, in our case, the false positive rate uh, increases as well. So with that, we're fairly confident that the library is doing a good job on our behalf. So that was good. So then we asked the question, how does that scale? Well, there are a number of limitations to that, as you can imagine. The first one is Redis as a database. There are some limits that I won't go into detail, uh, but basically the key can't be bigger than X. Um, previously, a solution that has been proposed is uh, commonly referred to as dynamic bloom filters. You basically just add bloom filters to the mix in, uh, in parallel, if you will. The downside of that is that in aggregate, your false positive rate spikes, right? So for example, if you look at the red line, um, you have uh, let's say 100 bloom filters of 1% uh, false positive rate each. And that rate increases to roughly 60% just because you have 100 of those, right? So that's not a good, that's not good news. Uh, and of course, you know, you can always argue for more memory. So if you can put them all in memory, maybe that problem is solved. But another problem is the actual library implementation, not going into details. So we came up with a different solution that seems to scale well. Uh, again, taking information from our partners at, uh, uh, at HA in Croatia, they roughly currently have 800 million URLs, that's their entire uh, index, and they're anticipating a growth rate of 200, additional, 200 million additional URLs per year. So that's kind of our trajectory there. So we said, okay, let's create 16 Bloom filters. Let's name them all after one hex character, 0 through 9 and A through F. Uh, 
and then create a special ingest and a routing uh, uh, procedure, which is based on the hash value of the first character of the hash value of a URL. It will become more clear in a second here. And then ingest uh, the corresponding URL to the corresponding hash folder. Since it's based on hash values, the distribution should be somewhat equal. So here's how it works. We have our 16 Bloom filters on the bottom and our magic blue box in this case that takes the input URL 2022 jcdl.org, creates an MD5 hash of that string. As we can see, the value starts with the two. So that uh, URL will be ingested in the Bloom filter named two, right? Makes sense. If we do this for Ha, uh, the uh, hash value starts with a three. So we'll ingest it into the third or the, the uh, Bloom filter named three. So for this sort of a, um, a concept, which by the way, ingest and lookup is done in the same way, it really eliminates the, uh, the drawback of the dynamic Bloom filters that you don't need a parallel lookup. It's much, much faster. And the, uh, the false positive rate remains uh, mostly stable. Right? And uh, we did our math for, for how currently we've implemented it. Currently, um, you, we, we get a false positive rate of the entire index, uh, false positive rate at 5% for, uh, for only 1.6 gigabytes. Right? I'm not selling this, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really good number, I think. And given the uh, anticipated growth rate, they're basically good for 10 years in this context, plus or minus. And of course, this can scale further, right? You can not only take the first character of the hash value, you can take the first two, first three, you can create more Bloom filters in parallel and so on and so forth. Uh, it wouldn't be us if you're familiar with our work, if you hadn't implemented a pilot or several pilots to prove that this can actually work. Here's an, uh, a screenshot of the, uh, the web interface that I, that I queried. And I asked the web interface, um, does the you know, Europe Zagreb URL exist in your, in your collection? I'm asking the 16 Bloom filters for how they've implemented. And I got it, uh, you can see this up there on the top of the slide. I got an HTTP 200 response, which basically in our case means, yes, uh, there is a copy of this URL available. If there was no copy, it would get a 404. Right? copy not found, if you, if you will. So just as a very simple uh, yes, no uh, uh, service to, uh, to demonstrate that Bloom filters can, can work in this context. Similar to our uh, uh, Memento time travel service as a service that uh, uh, basically federates results from all over the place, we implemented a pilot that is based on Bloom filters generated from CDX files, not only from HAW, but also from the Internet Archive and from the British Library. Uh, and uh, generated a, a web service, if you will, an endpoint for that. And uh, just two screenshots here. Um, it turns out on the top left that all three archives have a copy of the robots.txt file from WordPress. So that's good to know in case you're wondering. And uh, uh, only two, the British Archive and the uh, British Library, and the Internet Archive have a copy of the URI shown here on the bottom right, but Hall does not. Very simple, not particularly intelligent, not particularly pretty uh, interface, but just to demonstrate an aggregation of these services can work as well, right? So then together with Hall again, we're interested, well, how can we address this notion of people being somewhat hesitant to share um, their, their, their index, share information about what they actually have? Well, as uh, uh, we now have shown, Bloom filters can work in this context, can introduce, let's say, a level of uh, confidence that I'm not sharing anything in plain text, I'm sharing hash values. Uh, how do we communicate that? Sitemaps seemed like a logical choice, right? Sitemaps are all over the place. We have tools for, to, to generate sitemaps. They have been around forever. Search engine like them uh, if you wanted to go there. And so Ha has actually generated this process of serializing their Bloom filters into a CSV file and sharing that, uh, communicating through uh, site, the sitemap protocol, right? And of course, we wouldn't be, you know, uh, good librarians if we didn't include additional metadata. Uh, and so we did that here too, you know, in the in the Dublin Core namespace. And I put the uh, URL of the of the uh, of the sitemap that is available on the uh, Creation Web Archive website right here on the bottom of the slide. So to sum up. Uh, I think we got confirmation that this can actually work, right? This is a feasible way of uh, uh, creating an index of uh, archival holdings for web archives. It has pros and it cons, right? It's not free, but it seems to be very, very fast in terms of uh, uh, query response time. It enables derivative services such as the aggregated search or the federated search, as I showed, 
However, I don't expect the NR archive, for example, to create a bloom filter or many bloom filters across the entire collection, right? That seemed a bit excessive, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, so we do actually consider this most suitable for maybe smaller archives, like the creation map archive, or par for parts of an archive. So for example, we could envision these data sets that Helga mentioned, well, that could be a bloom filter for an individual data set as a quick and easy way to query, does this URI exist? Does that URI exist, right? So those sort of things are possible. Uh, in addition, bloom filters are currently used and could be down the road further used as well for uh, deduplication during a crawl, during, uh, in, in real time during a crawl. Have I seen this URL already? Not sure, right? So there, there are optimization, uh, uh, optimization possible there. I mentioned the code that we created and shared with our collaboration partner. We finally got the approval, approval from, uh, from the lab that we can publicly uh, share that as open sourced URI is here. And of course, uh, I, it wouldn't be me if I didn't uh, acknowledge my collaborators who majestically contributed to this effort. Uh, Cody on the left, Ziva on the right. So thanks for that. And uh, with that, I think I'm at time and I appreciate your attention and happy to discuss any and all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Martin.